Hey, I'm Chris, and this is MMA for You. I'm going to be doing my post fight analysis for UFC 203, Neo Chick vs. Overeem. But before I get into that, I'd like to plug my own author's website at www.chrismaldon.com. I am an author specializing in the fantasy genre, and you can buy some of my works, starting with my first novel, an action adventure called The Mustard Prince in the Condiment Kingdom for $4.99 on my website on PDF format or if you have a Kindle such as an e-reader you can buy it for $4.99 on Amazon.com also for just $1.99 on my website on Amazon.com you can buy some of my short stories and short story collections starting with the fantasy horror short story The Land of the Wooden Statues which I'm trying to make into a full novel the Horror Collection, which is a compilation of three of my gothic horror short stories. And my Fantasy Fable Collection, which is a compilation of four of my Fantasy Fable short stories. Uh, links to buy these will be in the descriptions. Also, um, on the descriptions, a link to my Twitter page, uh, a link to my author's page on Facebook, and a link to my like author's YouTube page, uh, which is pretty much like manga reviews and me reading some of my stories and short stories and what, or parts of my stories and my short stories, all on my uh, the description. So on to this card. Uh, weird night of fights. What can you say? The main event was strange, and well, not strange. Um, it was a little strange with uh, over him running and just kind of like mentally collapsing and whatnot. Uh, it was a good fight though. I'm, I'm not gonna lie, that was actually a pretty fun fight. That was like, well, it was strange actually was over claims of phantom tapping, you know, from the guillotine. Verdu versus Brown was absolutely strange from like the dislocated Brown calling a timeout. To how the fight went from like Verdum going all really exciting in the first round and just steadily just dying. And that fight was just steadily going down. And then uh, Verdum and Tarver Edmund Tarverdian, uh, Travis Brown's coach, getting into a scuffle. Mickey Gall versus CM Punk happened. Um, you know, some of the questionable judging here, too. I versus Kohei is a bit questionable. Giving Kyle Magalhaes, uh, one of, you know, like, a 29-28. It's just, it's just such a strange night. And, and even before the fights happened, he had Overeem coming in late for the weigh-in. Not one, but two elevator incidents. You had one elevator incident involving a group of fighters and coaches stuck in an elevator. And then he had a second elevator incident with C.B. Dalloway that had that required him to be pulled out of the fight because he got injured. So this was just a strange. Not, I mean, there were like, and oh yeah, Ray Borg, um, falling out of this fight due to illness, like one or two days before the fight. I mean, it went down. It was I think it started at a thirteen fight card, and it went down to ten fights. So, maybe a 12 fight card. I, I, I forgot. There's so much strangeness, strangeness going on uh, that it's it's really hard to say. Picks weren't too bad. I got 7 out of 10. I, I, I'd say that the only real egregious one in hindsight was probably Drew J Dober versus Jason Gonzalez. The other two I missed was Betch Gohea versus Jessica I and Overeem versus Miochik. Uh, as far as bonuses go, Andrade and Maduro's picked up performance of the night, while Miochik and Overeem got five of the night. So let's get started. Stipe Miochik defeated Alistair Overeem by knockout, four minutes and 27 seconds in the first round. So this fight really shows what Miochik and Overeem are all about. Just in the sense of, here's Miochik. He gets dropped, but he's durable, he's resilient, he gets back to his feet, he hits hard, he's opportunistic, and he gets the win. You know, 
good stuff for Miocic. He's a solid fighter, real solid heavyweight, hits hard. Don't know if he'll keep the title, but, um, you know, he's our champion right now. He is a very good, he's an elite heavyweight, you know. He beat Verdum, he beat Overeem, he's beat Arlovsky. He's beat good competition. And this shows a lot about Alastair Overeem. <laughs> You know, after watching this fight, my my friends that I was watching with this with kind of came to the same conclusion. Miocic won the fight, and he, he found the opportunities, got the ground and pound, and won. But in the same sense, it almost seemed like Overeem lost the fight for himself. And I'm not saying this because I'm like, because I picked him to win. That doesn't matter. But... Also, I'm actually criticizing him, like, big time here, because this is, like, pretty much what you see from Alistair Overeem as far as how he loses. He starts strong, dropping Miocic, going for the ski team, almost just getting the win, just a couple minutes in the first round. Starts strong, and just absolutely mentally collapses. I don't know what happens if he gets hit hard and his confidence just dies, or if it's like, oh, I could, you know, I hit this guy really hard. I went for a finishing move. I couldn't finish him. My confidence is dead. <laughs> One or the other happened with Alistair Overeem here, and it is not unlike uh, the, uh, not unlike Alistair Overeem for this to happen. We haven't seen it in a while, but it's, you know, this specter, I guess, is always there, and it came at the absolute worst time. There was a lot of running, like literal running from Overeem, which is really odd, but I think I understand it. If you ever look at where Overeem was finding success, where he doesn't find success is when his back is against the cage. Because people just tee off on him. He shells up. She is all the time as Alistair over him. He gets hit. He shells up. He doesn't return fire. Happened here. <laughs> uh, and it seemed like he was running to get back to the center of the cage. But like he was doing it like really terribly. Um, at the very end, he's on his back. And he's just covering up. He's in like an open guard situation, allows Milchik to posture up, and he's just covering up, and then he gets knocked out. He doesn't hold him, he doesn't control his posture, he doesn't put his feet on, on his hips to kick him off, he just lies there and gets finished. It's almost like a defensive mechanism for him, you know? <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's pretty bad. Um... And yeah, that is the worst of Alistair Overeem at the same time, where it's like, you can see what he's capable of. He has fight-ending power. I mean, he didn't just drop Miocic early and went for a guillotine. He then wobbled him again <laughs> in the fight. You can actually see the fight. Like, Miocic takes a left, and all of a sudden, he's on Queer Street. And, um, yeah, or, you know, he's just, he's wobbled, you know? And... Yeah, <laughs> you know, then you see the worst of Overeem of just covering up, mentally collapsing, and almost waiting to get finished. Good on Miocic's part, though. Took the opportunity, found the opportunities, went after it, wasn't, his resolve didn't go down after getting dropped and hit hard. He's still there, and that's what's great about Stipe Miocic. He's very game. He is a very good fighter. Still has defensive liabilities, obviously. But he's game. He hits hard. He's a solid boxer. Solid wrestler. He's tough. And uh, it's enough to win a title. It's enough to defend a title. So, with that said, uh, Stipe Miocic probably gets Cain Velasquez next. Cain Velasquez is coming off a good knockout over Travis Brown. It's a fresh matchup. It's an interesting matchup. They'll probably go with that next. Other guys that are in the queue. Josh Burnett, he's coming off a good win over Andre Olovsky. 
Um, Junior Dos Santos coming off that good win over Ben Rothwell. And then Junior has beaten Stipe Miocic. And this was not... This was like the bad Junior Dos Santos, you know, when he was like backing himself up against a cage. Kind of just like a more of a mindless brawler than like a, a technical boxer. Um, I, I'm actually convinced that, that what we saw from Ben Rothwell is hopeful, hopefully a new Junior Dos Santos. So there's a story with Miochik versus, they have history and, and Dos Santos. Um, so maybe see Junior De Santos. Most likely, I, I'd guess it's Cain Velasquez who's next for Miocic. Alistair Overeem, I mean, get a rematch against Travis Brown, who also just seems really bad these days. If you want to go winner versus loser, that's fine. Overeem versus Josh Barnett is a very interesting matchup. Or you can go like Overeem versus Mark Hunt, which would be a rematch from uh, was it Pride or Dream? From, rematch from Japan. Uh, that'd be interesting at this endeavor of their careers. Of course, Mark Hunt is like more or less boycotting the UFC at this point. <laughs> um, next one after that, Fabricio Verdun defeated Travis Brown by unanimous decision. So, I mean, this fight couldn't start any cooler. <laughs> and this fight kind of shows that Verdun, in a sense, it showed that Verdun wasn't razzled, you know, rattled by the fact that he got knocked out by uh, Stipe Miocic last time out. Verdum starts a fight with a jumping sidekick to the face. <laughs> like, I mean, he goes in there, runs at Verdum, jumps in the air, and sidekicks Travis Brown in the face, and it connects. And then he, he proceeds to just beat him down. <laughs> right hands land over and over again. He freaking... Drops Brown. During the middle of the first round, Brown calls a timeout that was actually given to him for a, apparently like a dislocated finger, hand, or something. The fight should have been called off as a TKO. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you know, great first round. Verdun's just rocking. And the next nice two rounds just suck. <laughs> like, it's just a weird thing. It's just... Verdum's still beating up Brown. Brown looks terrible. I mean, Brown has looked terrible for a while now. It has to be said, I I'm going to just keep going back to this. Edmund Tarverdian, in my opinion, this isn't a good coach for MMA. He, you know, he's a boxing coach. And quite honestly, Ronda Rousey is not a good boxer. She's not a solid boxer. She just... She hits hard, and she brawls. She, they, they all have this weirdly elongated stance. Wide stance. And, um, you know, their technique, boxing technique, isn't great. Their head movement isn't that great. Their defense isn't great. Their punching mechanics aren't that great. And... You know, it really calls into question Edmund Tarverdian. I mean, this has been noticeable for a while now. But it's, like, really noticeable now. Like, no one from that camp looks good, you know? When Jake Ellenberger moved to Hatfield Cardero's from Edmund Tarverdian's, right? Okay. So, one, Jake Allenberger even says in post-fight interview, I need to be meaner. What does, like, King's MMA, what's a really big thing with Hafo Cordero? Oh, hey, let's build up confidence. Let's make these, you know, like, most important thing in the fight is confidence. And you kind of just see it with their fighters. It's like, man, how do these guys become better strikers? Oh, they're really confident strikers now, too, you know? Ellen Berger fights Matt Brown. Everyone thinks, uh, mo most think that Ellen Berger is going to lose. Not everyone, but most. You know, this is, now he's under Cordero, drops Brown in first round, throws his ever, like, first ever body kick, which is also a trademark of Cordero's and King's MMA. Every, uh, like, all their fighters have good body kicks, and just beats Matt Brown in first round. And it's like, wow, where's, you know, like, this is the guy, you know, this is the coach that y you should be under, you know? This is a guy that's obviously changing your game for the better, for Jake Allenberger. 
Not Edmund Tarbadian, I'm sorry to say. You know? Well, and I feel that's kind of the same way for Travis Brown. Like, he just, he's a better coach. I, it's just, there's nothing about his game that's special. He hits hard. I mean, but it's like he doesn't have the technique. He doesn't have the defense to really do much about it. And it, it looks like, you know, Travis Brown had a really good chin. And I have to say, after a while, it looks like it's deteriorating, too. It's kind of sad. I mean, this Kane Velasquez just, like, put him out. I and mean, Vadrum was dropping him, too. I mean, it's heavyweight, sure. But, like, this was the guy that wouldn't go down from, like, that crazy fight against uh, Andre Arlovsky, you know? But, yeah, it looks like Brown's chin is slowly but surely deteriorating. So, after the fight, Verdum and Edmund Tarverdian get into a scuffle. Uh, apparently, no one was fined or, not, you know, there's no penalty to fighters. Which also goes to show, I, and like, yeah, it wasn't smarter. Verdum shouldn't have laid his hands on anyone, obviously, especially from the opposing camp. Um, but, like, just the fact that, like, Edmund kind of... Insta it, it seemed like Edmund kind of instigated the thing. Or the fact that it even just happened, you know? Kind of shows something of, you know, in my opinion, something of his character as well, you know? Um, kind of saw it in the Ultimate Fighter as well, where he was, like, getting up in this... I forgot which... Um, Dennis Hallman's face and whatnot, and then Rousey had to intervene, and it was... It's like, you know... I, I don't know if this guy... I, I don't know about this guy, really. Um, and he, he might be... In the words... If you ever seen, like, a... Uh, if you ever seen Bar Rescue, uh, one thing that John Taffer says in one episode, he's the kiss of death, you know? I kind of wonder if Edmund Tarverdian is the kiss of death for uh, a lot of MMA fighters. Um, to be quite frank with you. With that said, Verdum, uh, I, I would like to see Verdum versus Josh Barnett next. I think that's a good fight for both. I don't think they've actually fought each other, which is kind of crazy. And both of them are coming off, you know, good wins, you know, but not quite back in the title picture. I mean, Verdum, you can go with that re uh, match against Ben Rothwell. Roswell is coming off a loss, but it would be interesting. A rematch with Junior Dos Santos, honestly, at this juncture, wouldn't be the worst thing for Verdum. With Brown, I mean, I guess he can fight, like, Mark Hunt, I guess. A rematch with Overeem wouldn't be the worst thing. Um, I would honestly say give Brown the loser of Tibera versus Derek Lewis. Maybe even the winner of that fight. And, like, the winner of Roy Nelson versus Antonio Silva, because I think the loser of that fight can get cut. So, after that, Mickey Gall defeated Phil CM Punk Brooks by Ray Naked Choke in the first round. I mean, okay, Mickey Gall dominated CM Punk. I mean, that, that was it. You know, I mean, what can you say? He fought the smart fight. Uh, CM Punk was charging in. Mickey Gall... You know, there's some, like, ridiculous criticisms, like, oh, man, he was so scared to strike with him that he took him down right away. It's like, dude, any, like, smart fighter, <laughs> you know, any reasonable fighter, I mean, it, there, there's a level of reason that needs to be, that needs to be said here. You know, if you're charging forward and a takedown is available... You take the takedown. I mean, it, it just... You take what's given to you. It was given to him. And then he dominated him. You know? I mean, like, honestly. CM Punk, you know, managed to throw some strikes from his back. And that was it. <laughs> and then Mickey Gall just... Pa you know, passed a dominant position. Beat him up. And then got a second rear naked choke. And, and honestly... CM Punk looked helpless. I mean, it was just utter domination from Mickey Gall. I mean, it couldn't have played any better. I mean, if, if CM Punk just got a punch in, that, that may have actually looked 
made Mickey Gall look bad. <laughs> the fact that, like, Steam Funk didn't, couldn't even get, like, a punch, like, a real punch standing, except some, like, pitter-patter from his back, kind of gave us the result of the experiment that we thought would happen. You know, it's like, okay, what do you do? The experiment being, what happens when a guy with no athletic background who's like 37 years old, who has roughly two years of MMA training, fights a young, you know, I, I would say real fighter who's had training, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu brown belt, trains with the Miller brothers, and, you know, is a fighter, you know? I mean, this is a guy that's been, you know, he eats... When he's not fighting, I think he has a job as a trainer. You know, that, that's what they do. You know, he, he's living the fighter lifestyle, you know. It, it seems like. He, it seems like Gall has something of a day job. And then, you know, he trains when he can't, it looks like. And he's young and he's hungry. You know, what do you do? What happens when layman, a layman fights a trained fighter? Oh, this is what happens. You know, that's the experiment, and it went how it really should have. Gaul then goes and calls out Sage Northcutt. I think that is the right fight to make next. Sage Northcutt's coming off a win over Enrique and Marin. Mickey Gaul is still 3-0. and Sage Northcutt is, what, 7-1, and 8-1, and you know? I mean, both are new, young fighters. It is actually... Probably the best matchup. And it's a winnable fight for Sage Northcutt. But also a winnable fight for Mickey Gall. So, and both of them have got something coming off of this fight. Or, or excuse me, like, Mickey Gall got, like, in pro wrestling terms, the rub from beating CM Punk. And then Sage Northcutt has his own star power. Just by being Sage Northcutt, really. <laughs> You know, um, so both of them have some level of name value. So it's actually, uh, I can't think of a better fight unless you want to feed Mickey Gall just some like Ultimate Fighter Latin America rejects or something like that, which, hey, honestly, not the worst thing for this guy. I, I, I think Mickey Gall um, has some potential, you know, I mean, at the very least, I mean, We'll say this right now. You can find Mickey Galls on Bellator undercards. Just two and oh fighters that may have some potential. You know, trains out a decent camp, young, looks relatively athletic. You can find a bunch of Mickey Galls, you know, like, like I said, on the undercard of Bellator, sometimes on the undercard of World Series of Fighting. You know, on, on some, you can find these guys on regional shows, but. You know, he if if you give him like Sage Northcutt and he beats a Sage Northcutt and then you give him like I don't know Enrique Marin, you know, and just some like these lower level guys, you know, and build him up, he could actually be something, or at least a guy that that's good enough to stay in the UFC, you know. Uh, Dana White said it's pretty questionable if uh, uh, Will Brooks or Phil Brooks, why I said Will Brooks. Phil Brooks fights in the UFC again. Joe Rogan was pretty much just saying that, like, look, this is pretty much the wrong way to do things. I mean, you got this 37-year-old novice who wants to fulfill his dream, and hey, it's cool. You know, I've been a CM Punk fan not since just WWE. I first time I saw CM Punk fight uh, wrestle, um, which was on video, not not live. Wrestle was against AJ Styles in ROH. You know, I mean, I've been following this guy's career for quite a while. When his finishing move was not the GTS, but the Pepsi Cola Plunge. You know, so, for all you pro wrestling fans out there, you know, like, I've been, you would know, if you, if you know those terms, like, or some of those terms and whatnot, you, you'd know that, like, I've been following this guy for quite a while. You know, um... But yeah, you know, Rogan's saying, like, hey, this isn't the right way to do things. And, and you know what? I, I gotta agree. It's like, hey, you, you know, you should be fighting amateur-level fights or just some, like, really low-level fighters. 
you know, to start out with. And then you can find a Mickey Gall after, you know, like three or four fights. But, you know, for for him to come in, Mickey Gall is only 24. Young, hungry guy, trained in a relatively good camp. BJJ Brown Belt versus Phil Brooks is like, you know, like, Rogan's saying blue or, or white belt. He might be. I, th- I was under the impression he was a blue belt. Um, yeah, you know. That is just an arduous task, you know, insurmountable odds, you know, considering b- both their ages and experience levels, you know. Um, you know what, though? The fact of the matter is this, too. If CM Punk does not find the UFC again, maybe the UFC, like, CM Punk sells star power. And you know Bellator is going to grab him. I mean, that's the fact that matters is this. If, if the UFC doesn't keep him, Bellator is going to grab him. I mean, that's the way it goes. And I, I kind of doubt that he's going to fight in some regional. And, you know, I mean, after all this exposure, I, I doubt he's just going to fight in some, like, regional league. You know, I, I'm, I'm sure Bellator is going to try and take him. So, I can actually see CM Punk fighting into the UFC again, it, it just, it wouldn't surprise me, you know, um, <clears throat> it, it, it just really wouldn't, uh, next fight after that, Jimmy Rivera defeated Irai Fe by unanimous decision, this was also a very odd fight, in the sense that Faber kicked Rivera in the groin, he eye-poked him, but Rivera still managed to work through it and get the win. Uh, the leg kicks worked to great effect against Faber, and Hevera's boxing. You know what? I mean, really. And Hevera's hard to take down, so it, it was just... And it has to be said, I mean, Faber used to be the guy that beats everyone except for championship-level fighters. Now, he's having a hard time with non-championship-level fighters... You know, Francisco Rivera he had a hard time with. Alex Caceres. Frankie Sines. Like, he had a really hard time with these guys. And now, he's he's just straight up losing to guys that are not champions. Uh, starting with this fight. And, and it was bound to happen. And this was probably the fight. This was the fight to do it. You know, Rivera, I felt, was the better boxer. Faber's never been a great boxer. You know, I mean, like, as far as his hands go, his hands have never been that great. He's dropped a couple guys with his hands, but he's not a great boxer, you know. Um, and then Faber's shown susceptibility to light kicks. So, Havera also, really good takedown defense. Faber didn't go for many takedowns. So, it was kind of a losing proposition stylistically for Uri Faber. It just, a lot of his game just isn't there that made him great he's still tough as nails though um but you know jimmy avero now puts himself in the upper echelon of bantamweight he got the the name win over Faber, and um you know he's in that mix now you know where like cody garbrandt is brian caraway is kind of there and and those are good next fights for him too if ever getting brian caraway would be actually a really good fight Cody Garbrandt, or like even TJ Dillashaw next would, would be alright. Favor want, may want to consider retirement at this point. I, I, just, I don't see what he can do at this point. He's just taking fights against... He, he always does this, and he, he's usually managed to win. He'll always take these like... And, and props to Favor for doing this. He just takes these really dangerous fights against these young up-and-comers. You know, that Favor has nothing to really gain from beating them. But, like, everything to lose. In the, well, not not for himself, but in the sense that, like, the other guy is making the name off of, like, Faber. Um, I mean, if he wants to keep fighting, I mean, whoever is the next, like, dangerous up-and-comer, you know? If he wants to get, like, Rob Font or something like that, you know? Do that, you know? Like, that's what he'll do, you know? Like I said, props to Faber, like, cause that's that's his that's been his MO. Hey, I'll take the most dangerous fight. If not, give him you know, give him some sort of like 
like fun fight, you know, like the Frankie Edgar fight or or something like that, you know, you know, give him go favor Cub Swanson, you know, I, I don't know, just some really fun fight at like 145 if if need be, you know, um, it, it can be whoever, you know, it, go do that with favor, you know. So, a good one for Hevera. You know, the problem with Hevera, though, is I just don't see, like, this guy's very good. I've been pretty high on him since he got into UFC. I've actually, except for the Yuri Alcantara fight, I've actually picked him to win most of his other fights, and for good reason. He's a very good fighter. I don't, I'm going to say this right now, though. His skill set doesn't look championship level to me. I'll say this right now. It, it just it, maybe it's good enough to get him into a title shot, but it's not good enough for him to win a title. In my personal opinion, it's like he has a very good bo kickboxing game, but it's <clears throat> it's not a devastating one. You know, a guy like did he fight Pedro Munoz? Managed to fight through it, and even hurt Jimmy Rivera, you know, even the URL Contra managed to hurt Jimmy Rivera, and Rivera has a good takedown defense and good ground skills, but like, you know, I, I think he can defend a good amount of takedowns and whatnot from a lot of fighters, but like, it's just nothing about his game is like devastating, you know, it's not like Cody Garbrett has some real power to strikes. TJ Dillashaw can run circles around guys, you know, same with Cruz. Havera doesn't have that, you know what I mean? Um, and that's why, like, I just don't think he's quite there yet. Um, like I said, he good enough to fight for a title, though. I just don't know if he's good enough to win a title. Um... You know, but that's just me kind of almost like splitting hairs with Hevera at this point. I'd still pick him to win against a large majority of UFC bantamweights. Next right after that, Jessica Andras defeated Joanna Caldwood by guillotine. Four minutes and 38 se eight seconds in the first round. Um, Domination from Jessica Andras. <laughs> what can you say? She looks fantastic at this weight class. However, I want to see her in a three-round fight. It's like, you know, she's only 24. She has 20 fights, so she has a good amount of experience. Um, but, you know, she had a dominating win over Penne, and now has a dominating win over John Caldwell, who is, like, number six in the rankings. Um, what can he say? She took her down, John Caldwell down. Ground and pounded her to like oblivion, <laughs> pretty much. And then her best choke, her, her best submission is a guillotine, and then like lands a sub and gets the win. And Joanne Caldwood, slow starter, she's not great off her back. And Andrade is hyper aggressive, really strong. And on the ground, I mean, she's the only problem with Andrade on the ground when she's on top is she gets so wild. That, like, against Marion Renault, she got, like, triangle choked for it. But, like, I don't know if that's going to happen in this division. You know? Like, she's so strong and just, like, aggra hyper-aggressive. I just don't know if that is a real danger for Andrade at 115. Um, and, and her ground and bounce seemed to have hurt, like, Joanne Calderwood. And, you know, this was my problem with Caldwood, you know? It's just, like, I, I, I thought she'd be able to defend the takedowns better, but, man, Andrade just slammed her to the mat quite easily. Um, you know, like I said, I like what I see from Andrade. Her getting a title shot against Joanna and Jacek wouldn't be the worst thing. I'd like to see Joanna and Jacek versus Carolina Kovalkovic first, because one... For one thing, they're both undefeated. They're both Polish. There's a really good storyline with the two. And, and Carolina got a really good win over Rose Naminas in the last bout. And, and is on a good win streak herself. So I'd like to... I think they should go with the Carolina versus Johanna fight first. But if Andrade wants to get the winner of that, I, that's not a problem. If not, you can keep Andrade busy with like Tisha Torres or Carla Esparza next. 
Um, those are fights that I expect Andrade to win. And, um, you know, it's over some, I, I believe Torres and Esparza, I know Esparza's top five. I believe Torres might be top five as well. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but yeah, you know, stay busy fight against, like, a top five opponent. Um, wouldn't be the worst thing for Andrade as well. Even though Andrade is pretty much in, like, in the top five, you know. Uh, Caldwood, she can get Jutai, Juliana DeLima. Caldwood versus Namajunas, who's coming off that loss to Carolina Kovacovic, wouldn't be too bad either. I think that's actually the next best fight to do for both. Caldwood versus Namajunas. We can go Caldwood versus Jessica Aguilar. I always thought would be a pretty cool fight as well. Count of FS1 Freelands. Batch Cohea defeated Jessica I by split decision. This was a very contentious decision. I totally thought that Jessica I won, won rounds one and two. This fight sucked. I mean, honestly, it was terrible. I was landing some really good counter rights, but then would, like, sell out on that right hand and, like, would throw it short a lot of times. And then also, like, I totally coasted on the third round, thinking that, like, but I guess she believed that she, like, definitively won rounds one and two. And it seems like she just, there was a point in the fight where she just threw nothing for, like, over a minute. And it cost her, you know, and that was really stupid of Jessica I. I thought she should have won the fight. Betsko Haya did not look very good in this fight, but she won, you know, and she gets a stay in the UFC. Um, I'm sure that this guy is probably cut because she's on a three or four fight losing streak now, and Betsko Haya just saved her job. She can just fight, I don't know, Sarah Morris or, like, I don't know, if you want to give her, like, someone come out if I win, Caitlin Chukagian or something like that. She can fight someone that's just kind of there, you know. I saw that Brad Tavares defeated uh, Kaya Magalhães by split decision. I don't know what one judge saw from Kaya Magalhães to even give him a 29-28. Uh, Magalhães couldn't really, like, in the grappling phases, couldn't keep Brad Tavares down on the mat. I don't even think really got the better of the clinches against the cage. I thought Tavares was doing better there. And standing, Tavares is doing better there too. Tavares is just the weirdest guy because, like, he has proper technique. He's not a small guy. But for some weird reason, he just does not have KO power. There's just something about the guy. <laughs> like, he's, like, landing flush counters with his right hand. I mean, like, he'd slip a punch, throw a right hand, like a right hook, and, and just throw a perfect counter on Magalhães. And, and it's like, yeah, you'd kind of stun him. You won't, but he just can't drop a guy. I mean, it's it's weird. Like, his technique looks great. You know, there's nothing wrong with his technique. He's not necessarily arm punching. He, he's not, you know, he's not looping his punches. They, they look like, they look like good technique, you know? And for whatever reason, he just does not have heavy hands. I mean, it's just for what, it's the weirdest thing. Brad, Kyle Mega S is going to be with Josh Man, um, Brad Scott, Chris Camozzi, and he can fight anyone with Sam Alvey, Daniel Kelly. He's just, he's big, he's tough, and he isn't, I keep talking about it, and Kyle Magalhães is there, mid-tier purgatory. He is firmly entrenched in mid-tier purgatory. Brad Tavares has managed to actually get himself out of it, and I think, but the problem is, he cannot, he can't ever seem to break the top 10. Like, he is firmly stuck in, like, the top 11 to 15, and I think he'll permanently be stuck there, you know? Um, it's better than being that absolute rank and file, you know? Like, I think he'll beat all those guys I mentioned. Sam Alvey, uh, Hafu Natal, Chris Camozzi, you know, just that absolute mid-tier, like, guys that never seem to get out of that mid-tier. But, like, then he'll go up against, you know, someone in top 10 and he'll lose that fight. But, like, you know, that's where he is and that's kind of where he'll probably stay. I started that Nick Lance defeated Michael McBride by TKO in the second round. Yeah, you know, I like Nick Lance. Um, I think he's solid. You know, his 
His technique isn't that great as far as striking goes, but he's a willing striker. Um, he, this fight really showed that he's kind of small for the weight class, but, you know, he's he's in it, you know. He's there. He doesn't want to cut to 145. Good on him. He's probably starving himself, you know. Um, but, you know, it's kind of concerning that Michael McBride, honestly, he didn't. Michael McBride's technique, standing, is just not very good. It's really sloppy. But he still managed to drop Nick Lance, which is like, Nick Lance says that, like, you know, it's it's good that he's a willing striker, but, like, yes, he will forsake his defense, <laughs> striking. Uh, but Nick Lance, once he can get his wrestling going and his top control and the wrestling ride going and whatnot, the guy's a terror. You know, he, he can be, you know, Nick Lance can be, honestly. He can be Darren Elkins. Um, he, he and, and for a while at 145, he was Darren Elkins, you know. <laughs> but like, I don't think he ever fought Darren Elkins. He can just be the like the one the 155 er Darren Elkins, just tough as nails guy. And if he if he can take you down, he'll make your life very miserable for the next 15 minutes unless he decides to uh, finish you off. And, yeah, that's Nick Lentz, and, and that's really, he's not much of a prospect, he's just more of a veteran, veteran gatekeeper at this point. And, hey, you know, that's fine, you know, I mean, lightweight to tank, a shark tank, you know, having a role in lightweight is better than not having one. Um, I, I just don't see it with Nick Lentz, like, really progressing that far up, I, I really don't. You know, I think he had a shot at 145. He got pretty far there, but at 155, I, I just, I just don't see it. You know, with that said, Michael McBride, just lower, lower tier fighters of the division. Nick Lance, make him a gatekeeper. Honestly, just make him a gatekeeper at this point, um, and make him do what gatekeepers do. And so after that, Drew Dover defeated Jason Gonzalez by TKO in the first round. Um. Agree to speak. I, I was actually having some discussions with some uh, commenters about this. Uh, and, um, you know, what I was saying was I wasn't quite convinced that Drew Dober was a very consistent fighter. I was very impressed with his last fight uh, against Holtzman. I thought that he may have turned the corner and just showed to be a solid veteran presence in the UFC. But before that, he gets guillotined by, like, Efrain Escudero in the first round. And before that, his last one was against Jamie Barner, who, like, slammed his own head against the mat, you know? So, like, I couldn't really... I couldn't really, like, definitively say anything about Drew Dover, if he's just another rank-and-file guy, or if he finally just really put it together. And, you know, it's funny with Drew Dober getting the, the knockout here. Last time he got a knockout was, like, what, six years ago, you know? But I think I can definitively say now that Drew Dober has officially put it all together. Striking looked good. He fought a smart fight against a taller guy, utilizing the overhand right, using uh, using good kicks. And, uh, I think he even tried to wrestle a bit with Gonzalez as well. And, um, I think I, I can definitively say that Drew Dober is now, I don't think he'll ever really break into the top 15, but he, he's a solid hand in the division. He looks like, he looks like a veteran now. You know, he knows what to do and has a particular skill set to be able to do it, but doesn't have an elite level skill set. You know, it's very much like Evan Dunham. I guess, where it's just kind of like, he can strike well, and against lesser strikers, he'll beat them, and he can wrestle well, and against lesser wrestlers and grapplers, he'll beat them in that aspect too, but he's not like, the, he's not elite at any of those one areas, he, his striking actually is pretty dang good here, I was actually quite surprised. I seen him striking before, and it looked all right, but over here, and he didn't, he's never showed that much power. But this fight he did, and um, yeah, I, you know, I, I think, I, I, you know, I, I, I suspected he turned a corner in the Holtzman fight, but I think this this fight really sealed it because he he just did the right things against the opponent that like 
a true experienced fighter would do. It's like, oh, hey, he's a tall guy, he likes to jab. Okay, I'll throw the elbow on right, I'll kick him. Also, keep him honest with my wrestling. Okay, hey. And that's what he did. And Jason Gonzalez, you know, he'll probably get another fight in the UFC. Drew Dober, I think he's on a two-fight win streak. Uh, if you want to give him, like, a Nick Lance or, um, heck, the winner of Dunham versus, uh, um, Rick Glenn or, you know, just someone, a solid mid-tier guy. Or you can even go Drew Dober versus Jim Miller. That would be cool, too. Go that, uh, go that route with him. And finally, Yancey Medeiros defeated Sean Spencer by rear naked choke in the second round. Uh, you know what? This is the weight class where Yancey Medeiros belongs. I I'm not going to lie. I, I don't think he was that good at 155. Um, you know, he's kind of tall. I think he's missed weight at 155. So, you know, he has some power. Uh, he has some pretty good grappling ability. He's tough. He's got a good chin. And, you know, he's not undersized at 170. So, he's not going to have the huge height and reach advantage, but he won't be, like I say, he shouldn't be undersized either. And it's a good weight class for him, you know. He doesn't have to starve himself. Yeah, I, It wouldn't surprise me to see him uh, have a couple more of these type of performances against, like, the lower level guys of the division and, and maybe have some pretty decent performances uh, against some of the mid-level guys. And with Sean Spencer, though, he's probably cut at this point. I think he lost his last fight as well. Um, I always thought Sean Spencer's a solid fighter, but, you know, he, he's just, he's not a potent finisher. He's not heavy-handed as well. So, just more lower to mid-tier guys in the division for Yance Medeiros. So, uh, that's pretty much it for my post-fight analysis for UFC 203. If you have any comments, just leave them below. And uh, check out my author's website at www.chrismodon.com and uh, buy some of my works, starting with my first novel, uh, the, a fantasy adventure called The Mustard Prince in the Condiment Kingdom for $4.99 on my website on Amazon.com. Or check out my short stories for $1.99, uh, like The Land of the Wooden Statues, The Horror Collection, or The Fantasy Fable Collection. Links to all these. Uh, are provided in the description and also links to like my Twitter page, my author's Facebook page, or my author's YouTube page is also on the description. So that's pretty much it for MMA for you. Thank you guys very much.